What is biological control? One definition that's often used is this one here by Eilenberg that says that it's the use of living organisms to suppress the population of a specific pest organism, making it less abundant or less damaging than it otherwise would be. It's very utilitarian. It has a component having to do with an action. It's the use of, um, but it also has some limitations. Uh, George Heimpel and Nick Mills uh, in their recent book suggested that uh, a better definition might involve something like this that's more focused on the interactions between organisms rather than uh, intent or uh, whether the organisms are living uh, or not. They propose that uh, biological control is the indirect positive effect of a biological control agent on humans that is mediated by either direct or indirect negative effects of that agent on the population of one or more of the target species. So humans are part of this equation uh, here. We're the ones that benefit from the effect of a biological control agent. This dotted line here indicates that there's a positive indirect effect of the biological control agent on humans. And it's mediated through this uh, organism here uh, that is having a negative effect on humans. It's a pest, maybe it's even a pathogen, uh, and so on. And it's the negative effect of the biocontrol agents on the target that really matters. Back to the old adage, the enemy of my enemy is therefore my friend. Here. The nice thing about this definition is that it's broad enough to incorporate uh, a biological control agents that might not really be considered as, li as living, like viruses, uh, and also naturally occurring uh, biological control. That, uh, that is, uh, this is not the intentional release or manipulation of the biocontrol agent, but it could incorporate things like modifying the environment here, um, actually here, that is part of conservation biological control. That is, making the environment more hospitable to naturally occurring uh, predators, parasites, pathogens that allow them to have uh, an effect on this uh, target pest uh, species that is harming us uh, in some particular way. So the nice thing is that it's, uh, it's focusing on the interactions. Biological control fits into a broader umbrella of pest management strategies that include uh, things like mechanical and physical and cultural controls, things that uh, people can do to get rid of pests, uh, the development of host plant resistance or other kinds of uh, genetic tools that make plants uh, or animals, uh, for that matter, uh, less uh, susceptible to, uh, to pests. Both of these are, uh, are enhanced or uh, done by, by people. Um, there are things like autocytal control, the use of uh, Wolbachia or other uh, gene editing tools that uh, make uh, pests uh, less likely to uh, reproduce. Um, there are biorational chemical agents and conventional pesticides uh, as well. And biological control is one of these tools that fits into this integrated pest management um, paradigm. Within biological control, there are different categories of how it is actually practiced. We've already talked a little bit about classical biological control or importation biological control. There is augmentation biological control, which has two categories, depending on uh, whether you like to break it up this way, inoculation and inundation biocontrol. And then there's conservation biological control. And I just wanna say a couple of words uh, relating to these uh, really briefly. Classical or importation biological control is basically, as the name suggests, the idea of reuniting a potential pest with its natural enemies. Uh, we talked about this early on in the class, things like the cottony cushion scale native to uh, Southeast Asia or uh, Australasia, uh, and the Vidalia beetle or Rodolia cardinalis as it's called now, uh, that was uh, identified as a potentially important predator, which then was released in uh, Southern California where it still maintains and suppresses these, um, these pests of citrus. So importation of the biological control agent resulting in this top-down effect that benefits uh, people. This has also been done, this has been done hundreds of times, and it's also been done for the control of weeds. 
Um, I'm just picking one here just because it's, um, it's a, a very well documented example of St. John's wort, Hypericum perforatum. Uh, this is a, a plant, a little composite that's native to, um, to Europe um, and the, the Mediterranean. And uh, it, uh, it has spread in many parts of the world where it's been either intentionally or in, uh, uh, accidentally introduced. And there's a whole suite of herbivores, including this little uh, beetle here, uh, Chrysolina uh, beetle, that uh, can be used as a weed biological control uh, agent, a pest controlled by its consumer. Augmentation biological control is basically where organisms that are predators or pathogens are reared in large quantities, and then they're released into an environment where the pest uh, is, uh, is currently present. Um, one of them uh, that's a very well-studied example is uh, uh, predatory mites, uh, like uh, this one here, that are released in greenhouse situations for the control of other mites or other soft-bodied uh, insects. Uh, this is actually a gypsy moth cat caterpillar that's taken its classic stance uh, after it's died, taken over by a nuclear polyhedrosis virus. These viruses can actually be grown in uh, laboratory conditions, uh, loaded up into planes and actually sprayed into areas where uh, these caterpillars occur. And uh, as, the, uh, uh, as the virus enters the body of the uh, caterpillar, it basically uh, kills it. So the, again, this is uh, the more formal definition here is the release of natural enemies, predators, parasites, or pathogens uh, through this process that we call augmentation. It's the enhancement of uh, organisms that, uh, that may already uh, be there, usually done in a, in a commercial setting. To get this right, you've got to get the timing uh, perfect so that uh, you release the predators at a time when it's possible for them to actually have an impact on those populations. The two different uh, flavors of this are inundation and inoculative biological control. The difference between these is in uh, inoculative biological control, the idea is that the biocontrol agent actually has the capacity to reproduce and grow maybe a generation or two to increase their numbers to have a, a suppressive effect on the pest population. In inundation biological control, it's not really uh, stipulated that this needs to happen. You just dump a ton of lady beetles or predatory mites. They go out, they do their, their business, they kill off uh, and locally uh, drive populations of the pest extinct or certainly below levels where they're, um, they're gonna be damaging during a particular part of the production cycle. And that's the end of that. Um, so there's, uh, there's no real uh, in, in implication here that these are going to be sustained long-term interactions between the biocontrol agent and the pest. You can almost think of them as uh, biological insecticides where you release them, they knock the population down just enough for you to not uh, experience uh, crop, crop uh, damage, and then that's it. You're going to have to do it again uh, the next time uh, this becomes a problem. The final example uh, category, really, uh, of biological control is conservation biological control. This is the idea that uh, there are potential uh, antagonists of pests, natural enemies that are already in the environment that would normally be providing control of uh, or suppressing the populations, but that we've created agricultural environments that are actually very inhospitable uh, to them. And by enhancing their ability to survive and reproduce and maintain themselves, this gives them a chance to actually suppress the population of the, of the pests that we, don't, uh, that we don't want. In the podcast for this week, uh, my colleague uh, Doug Landis actually talks about this particular kind of conservation biological control and the various ways in which it's actually practiced. He talks about this uh, historical use of beetle banks in um, Europe in particular, where there are set-asides that are not used for crop production, like wheat production. And these little set-asides, these uh, hummocked uh, areas with perennial grasses on them, can act as reservoirs and as nurseries, really, of predatory insects that then move into the crops to feed on things like, uh, uh, like aphids or other crop uh, pests. There are also ways of enhancing the uh, capacity of natural enemies to reproduce and grow 
their populations by providing resources that they need, like uh, sugar from uh, flowering uh, plants. And so maintaining uh, diversity in these agricultural landscapes is one of the ways in which you conserve and actually uh, make uh, their lives a little bit better. Uh, and, uh, and Dr. Landis talks about various other ways in which we can do less harm to our uh, beneficial insects than we otherwise do already.